Let's start with Sky Captain Crag. So this is a seven cost, four six charge. Charge. And it costs one less for each pirate you control, each friendly pirate. I mean, a four six charge, like how much you, how much you know, are you willing to pay for a four six charge in general? I think that if you had a four six charge for five mana, you'd be very happy with that. It's a very powerful card. Uh, if you have five six charge for six mana, that's less exciting. It's still okay. As to whether you know you can realistically build a pirate deck that you can have a number of guys in play who can significantly reduce the cost of this, hard to say. Uh, we haven't really seen any new pirates that are particularly. Uh, I don't even know if we actually seen any new pirates in the set. Period. But. Uh, I mean, it's definitely it's definitely a powerful card if you're able to play it for reduced cost, um, and it could be potentially a, a hook for you know pirate deck uh, in the the new expansion. Uh, we've already seen a lot of powerful cards in pirate context, like uh, ships cannon, for instance, is a super powerful card. If there were a good basis of minions to play with ships cannon, I think that card would be outrageously powerful. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of dangerous for Blizzard to make too many good pirates, I think, because that card is so good. Um, which leads me to think that it's unlikely that we will see a lot of particularly efficient pirates in this set. Um, so that makes it so that it is unlikely that Sky Captain Craig is going to be particularly exciting. If, if the context, if the, if the appropriate tools to exist to support this, Force Charge is clearly very powerful, um, but. If we can if we can consistently cast this for five mana, I think I'm happy with it. If, we, if it's costing us six or seven, it seems tough. So. The Skeleton Knight. So, Death Rattle, reveal a minion in each deck. If it costs more, return this to your hand. Six costs seven, uh, seven, four. This is basically Salty Dog for one more mana, but if you win the Joust, if you win the, the sort of flip with it when it dies, uh, it comes back. So this is a card that, that I think in general is like not that strong. Um, obviously, the stat stat wise, like this just isn't a particularly great deal. Salty Dog doesn't really see play, um, and this is less less uh, efficient than Salty Dog. But uh, in the right context, this is actually a very powerful effect because if you're playing a really attrition based game, this can be a very effective card, kind of like a Nubarak. The big problem with this is that the matchups where this effect is going to be good are generally matchups where you are basically coin flipping with your opponent in terms of whether you get it back or not. Like, it, this could be good like in in Control Warrior versus Control Warrior, but then you both have a bunch of high cost minions in your deck, so your chances of winning the, the, the Joust are basically 50-50. So a 50-50 do I get this guy back is like not really that exciting to me. I, I do think that, that contextually it seems like it could be powerful, but because of the random element of uh, of the Death Rattle in the matchups where it is going to be uh, likely to be effective, it's basically just a coin flip, so uh, I'm kind of kind of not exciting on this. Generally speaking, I, it, it seems like it's mostly going to be weaker than like Cairn, for instance, or like Piloted Sky Goal in a lot of ways, because it's like, you know, those you're guaranteed to get a second half of the body, um, and this one, you circumstantially are going to be able to pay more to replay it if you happen to get lucky. So I, I think the concept is cool, but I don't necessarily think that this is a card that will be consistent enough in the matchups where you want the effect in order to be good. Justicar Trueheart. So this this is a, a seems like a fairly powerful card in like a control deck. You know, you, you can you can afford to spend a little bit of mana like in the mid game to just get a significant power on your uh, your significant upgrade to your hero power later on. I think the biggest upgrade here feels like it's eh, I was gonna say I think it's probably dire shapeshift. Because like two armor and two attack is is enough that it's a, it's a big swing both ways, like it's increasing your survivability significantly and it's increasing your uh, ability to actually kill minions pretty significantly. Um, I think the weakest is actually Soul Tap. Uh, I think that, that removing the, the, the life cost from the Warlock Hero Power is the smallest upgrade. Um, Totemic Slam also seems only okay. Like the, the ability to keep making Taunt Totems every single time does seem like it's potentially pretty strong. Um, this one's also pretty good, getting twice as many 1-1s. Again, like contextually, the power of the, the the paladin hero ability is very much diminished because of how vulnerable one one minions are. Poison daggers. This is okay, it's not, I, I, but I do think that the ones that are are like basically doubling. It's kind of funny to me that by the way, the hunter hero power doesn't double uh, because it's it's clearly an indication that it was just too good. <laughs> oh hey, we don't want to make this four four damage, even though everything else doubles because this one's just the best already. 
It's important to recognize this is permanent. Even if even if Justice Guard Two Hard dies, you continue to have the additional the upgraded hero power. I mean, this is definitely a cool card, and I do think that it's more likely to be a, a card that is is uh, valuable in decks that are looking to, to prolong the game uh, and generally use their hero power more. Usually, uh, ad aggressive decks will typically want games to go uh, a shorter period of time so that they don't necessarily care as much about the the power of their hero power. Uh, aggress or control decks will often have sort of. Uh, longer games, especially like Priest, for instance. Like Priest, sadly, like restoring four health, you're just gonna keep overhealing more. Uh, I, I wish the Priest like was like increase someone's health by amount, an amount. Like if this was, if this could actually bring your hero power, your your health above thirty, or like your increase your minion's health, like instead of healing, that would be much more exciting to me. Like increasing this to heal four, it's like so so mediocre in a lot of ways because you are often just overhealing anyway. Uh, but anyway, this is definitely a, a pretty exciting card. A, a 6-3 for 6 mana is a pretty weak body uh, in the context of uh, being able to actually contest opposing minions, but you do get a permanent effect from it, which is you know, definitely uh, pretty hard to evaluate compared to previous cards because we just haven't seen something like this before. Um, so I, I do think that this is uh, going to be a card that at least sees play initially because it's an exciting and cool new effect. Uh, and it's, it, it's likely to you know, see at least a reasonable amount of play uh, moving forward, because I do think it's powerful. Nexus Champion Sarad. So this is another card that, that is sort of a late game style value card with hero power stuff. You know, obviously wants to go in a deck that wants to prolong the game as long as possible, because every time you use your hero power, you get a card. Um, so this is a, a pretty exciting card for, like, Priest, actually. Like, Priest is a class that <laughs> frequently has lots of utility for its hero power, and will often get value out of extending the game. It, it is unfortunate that this, you know, is uh, is a kind of weak body that you're frequently going to only get like a use or two out of uh, because it is doesn't have particularly great survivability. Frequently you'll play this on curve and it'll just die. Um, so I, I do think this is a card that, that is more likely to be effective uh, if games go longer. Like if, if the, the metagame is such that, that, think that decks are more controlling, uh, this is potentially a very powerful card because uh, getting addition, getting basically draw a card. I mean, it's at a random spell, so it's like not really draw a card. In some ways, it's worse. In some ways, it's better. In, if you're going to, if you expect to be playing really long control oriented games, um, where uh, fatigue is a real issue, then getting cards that aren't in your deck is more valuable than drawing cards because you you get additional resources to expend over the course of a game. So, uh, and this is this is a, a tough card to evaluate because I don't think it's good in the current metagame. I think it's actually quite weak, but I do think that it, it is definitely a, a very cool card and uh, it is much like Just a Card True Heart, something that I expect to be explored. Um, and uh, yeah, Gormok the Impaler. This card is just... Like, it's a 4-4-4-4, four, 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 four. battle cry if you have at least four other minions, deal four damage. So 4-4-4-4 four, 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 four is already just not a good deal. This is one of the problems that I talked about uh, earlier with, you know, a, a game that involves direct attacking, and that, uh, spe specifically with, like, all generic costs for cards, like, a neutral card in Hearthstone, like, if this was just 4-5, it's just like, okay, this is strictly better than Chill and Yeti, for instance. Theoretically, I imagine that this is intended to be, you know, a sort of cheap legendary that aggressive decks can use, because there, there is there are very few of those. Most of the legendary cards in Hearthstone tend to be expensive cards, um, or like, you know, weird cards like Nat Pagel or, uh, or things like that. Whereas this is like, you know, a cheap, cheap legendary that an aggressive deck might want to play. Um, but it's just, it's just, stat-wise, it's just not good. You know, I would basically almost always rather just have Shredder than this card. You know, yeah, if you can, if you can guarantee that you're somehow going to have the battle cry every time, this card can be very strong. Uh, but it is, it, it seems like it is four, having four other minions when you play this seems so unlikely in most cases that you're gonna, you know, maybe this goes into like a token deck. You're playing like the new roots card or whatever, and I don't know, echoing ooze or whatever else. Even in that case, like having four other minions when you play this on like say four mana, it is, it just seems very difficult. A would be a powerful card if you could consistently enable it. So if there are decks, like token style decks, that can generate four minions, you know, consistently and keep them in play on turn four, it's like yes, four, a four four that deals four damage immediately is is certainly extremely strong. So the Light Bane Sisters, Fuel Light Bane. This card is very powerful. It's a three four for three, which 
is not on, on the surface particularly amazing. We have the generic spider tank at three cost, but three four for three is like a, you know a, a sort of the 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 high stat line for creatures without abilities, and this is a very good ability. Now, this is whenever you target with a spell, gain a divine shield, and if you're able to trigger this ability at like low or no cost, it's just super powerful. I would be shocked to see this, you know, not see competitive play, just because this is just such a such a high combination of power of just like stats and abilities. Uh, both of these cards specifically, and this one, this one actually I think is the more powerful one. Uh, whenever you target this minion with a spell, deal three damage to a random enemy. Both of those are very powerful effects. Um, it depends on the matchup where they're where they're they're more powerful. I think that uh, Idris is. Uh, more powerful against uh, against aggressive decks probably because they're likely to have multiple things in play. You're very more likely to hit a minion and actually kill it. Whereas the divine shield ability is more powerful uh, against mid range decks where you're likely to be able to you know attack this into the ubiquitous piloted shredder and just get a free kill on it, which is also super powerful. I, I do feel like as three force for three, they feel like they are best suited to priest decks because priest decks really care about creatures having high health for their cost. Because of the priest hero power, you're able to leverage the high health of uh, of your minions to keep them around and kill often multiple opposing minions with them. Uh, and also, thanks to Va Valen's chosen and uh, Power Shield, are both excellent self-target effects. So, I mean, even if even if you never buff these, they're actually pretty reasonable, pretty reasonable minions because of their their stats. So, I'm I'm very excited to see these uh, basically be sort of more of the early mid-range style of legendary card uh, that can go into those sort of decks. Frost Giant. One of the things that, that is often difficult for like controlling styles of decks um, is that you are frequently uh, very much constrained by your ability to, by just your mana in the late game. Um, that you can only do so much with sort of your big cost cards um, because you can only play like, you know, one of them a turn. Um, What's well, one of the reasons that like cards like Molten Giant and Mountain Giant um, are very powerful because they are high cost cards that conditionally can be played for very cheap. So you're able to generate a very significant board presence for for a very low cost. And Frost Giant, this is a card that that you know if you if you've hero powered five times in a game, you're playing a five cost eight eight. And it's unconditional as to any other any other aspects of the game state. Like while you know Mountain Giant, if you if you are playing a deck that doesn't have great card draw, well. You're, if you're playing a deck that isn't Warlock, basically, uh, you can often get into situations where you basically have to pay full cost for Mountain Giant. That obviously is pretty terrible. Um, and Molten Giant, similarly, your opponent can play around you, ha you being able to enable your Molten Giant uh, unless you're able to damage yourself. So obviously, totally busted hero power from Warlock just because we enable both of these. Great. But Frost Giant is a card that can theoretically actually go into a deck like Warrior or a deck like Priest um, and allow you to actually generate a significant board presence by playing multiple high high impact cards in a single turn. After you've spent like a, you know a relatively long game using your hero power to do various utility based things, um, so that's where I, where I would expect. If this card does see play, I'm not saying it will. If this card does see play, I, I do think that's the context in which it would would be in like priest or warrior control decks that are looking to be able to have more tools to generate like high impact board presence in a single turn. Uh, Again, not really sure that this card will really see play because it does assume a lot about the metagame in that you are playing a controlling deck that is able to get to the late game and not just immediately explode because your opponent combos you out with Patron Warrior. Um, but if that metagame does exist, it's possible that Frost Giant is a card that uh, that actually sees play in it. Do Grand Crusader. This is just a weird card to me. <laughs> um, just a six cost five five battle cry. Add a random paladin card to your hand. I mean, this is like a like a re relatively reasonable value card. You know, you you play it, you get an extra card. Um, but it's not. It's like the, the, there's a really wide range in terms of, of of paladin cards you can get. I mean, if you get like eye for an eye, card pretty horrible. If you get Tyrion, it's great. <laughs> um, so I don't know what the sort of average value that you get from this is. It's kind of like six. You know, six cost five five draw card. How good is that? It's like, well, it's, it's actually, you know, not necessarily that good. Like, I don't know that I'd play six cost five five draw a card, period. And it's actually, in, in a lot of cases, it's worse than that because you're drawing a card that is not necessarily a card that A, has synergy with anything in your deck, and B, is even of a power level that you would want in a constructed deck. So it, it does seem like it's possibly like a reasonable card in, say, Arena. Um, 
but I don't think that this is a card that is likely to make a significant impact on Constructed. All right, Kodo Rider. This is the this is a very high value late game card that you just get. You know, like if if, if you have Inspire, like compare this say to the uh, the Nexus whatever guy. The Nexus dude is uh, he's a what? He was a five cost four or five with Inspire basically draw a random spell. Uh, and Coda Rider is Inspire Mega Kodo, which in some ways is in some ways is worse because Kodos aren't necessarily as powerful as a lot of spells. But in some ways it's better because you don't have to pay mana for it. You know, this is actually just generating immediately uh, a three five in addition to whatever else your hero power is doing. Um, I I wouldn't I'm not really sure that this is this is the sort of thing that is likely to to you know really be particularly impactful in in, uh, in a lot of games. It's like not a, this is a value card. This is like if you're grinding out with with you know an opponent, uh, if you're playing a game that is going long and is is really resource based. It's kind of, I mean, this, this sounds ridiculous, but it's kind of like Ysera-like in that um, what it's doing is just generating a resource resource advantage as games go long. Um, it's obviously much easier to kill than Ysera, and it's obviously uh, the actual impact of the cards is, you know, getting the worst Ysera card every time, you're getting Laughing Sister, but it's a cheaper version. Um, so I don't really expect this to be a particularly powerful card, um, in Constructed at least, because just the impact you know, a three, five, or six is so such a low impact card immediately. And as you are playing, you know, further late game stuff, you have actually a Sarah that you can play, which, you know, probably better. But in say in say arena, like this is actually a very very powerful card in games that are that are going long. Getting effectively, you know, two, three, five bodies at least for your uh, for your single card is a pretty reasonable like sort of attrition plan. But yeah, I, uh, I think in general this is not going to be not going to be a great card. But I, I definitely like the the idea behind it. All right, crowd favorite four four. Whenever you play a card with battle cry, get plus one plus one. Um, this is, eh, it seems kind of kind of awkward to me, uh, in that when you do play it immediately, uh, it's a four four for four, which as I've mentioned many times, dies to pilot shredder. Um, it also dies to death spite. It you know even the front half of Death's Bite, your opponent doesn't even have to have the uh, the trigger originally, um, so it's this is like a a pretty mediocre card if you are uh, if you are sort of just looking at how it lines up with other uh, other cards of the same cost dies to swipe um, it, maybe it's maybe it's reasonable in you know arena if you get a ton of battle cry stuff but I don't really see this as being a card that is likely to be particularly effective in Constructed. I mean, maybe you play it with like a bunch of cheap Battlecry stuff, like Abusive Sergeant, uh, and you're able to buff it significantly pretty quickly, but uh, my my inclination is that it's unlikely to give you as m enough value given the sort of cost and deck building constraints compared to, again, Piloted Shredder or something like that. Uh, Master of Ceremonies. Uh, so it is a three cost, four two Battlecry. If you have a minimum of spell damage, gain plus two, plus two. This is a weird card. Uh, because, you know, as a 3 cost 4 2, it's, you know, pretty bad because it trades down uh, to things that cost 1. I'm not even a huge fan of, of, of uh, 3 cost 4 3s because they trade down to 2 drops. This trades down to commonly played 1 drops. Uh, but it's Battlecry is actually pretty huge. Battlecry game plus 2 plus 2 makes us a 3 cost 6 4. And that's, like, actually like, quite large. It, it's big enough to, you know, take out, like, a Sludge Belcher. It's big enough to take out 6 drops. Um, so I can imagine this actually being a card that you theoretically play, that you don't plan to play as a 3-drop, you plan it to play it as a 3-cost card you play alongside something else on a later turn. Uh, because, kind of like what I was talking about with Frost Giant, Frost Giant's a card that, you know, you, you, you are looking to create more of a board presence than you normally could for its cost because of what it, how it's enabled with its cost reduction. Similarly, like, this is... If you're able to play, you know, something that, like some sort of spell or some sort of, you know, cheap spell damage minion or whatever alongside this in a single turn, like if you play, if you play Thalnos into this on turn five, like, it's actually, it's actually a, a totally reasonable five cost card, a six, you know, six four. It's, I mean, it's not great, but it's, you know, you've, you've actually developed an additional minion or if you have, you know, something that's giving you spell power and you're able to play this and a spell in the same turn to remove your opponent's minion, it could be a pretty big tempo swing. Um, so... Right now, there aren't a lot of cheap spell damage minions, which makes this seem a little bit harder to to actually enable. 
Um, but again, this is the sort of card, I was talking about this with the, the, the taunt buff card that we had uh, in Warrior. This is the sort of card that uh, if there are good spell damage minions, this is a very powerful effect. Uh, and given the right conte context, I can see this card being extremely powerful. You know, Garrison Commander. Two cost, two, three. Already reasonable stats. Uh, you can use your hero power twice on your turn. Uh, that is actually a pretty reasonable effect. Generally, this is going to be an effect which is more compelling for uh, for control decks in general. One of the things that I actually always look for as a control as a control deck um, is early minions that can still have a meaningful impact later in the game. Uh, it's a reason that, that I like cards like Sun Fear Protector. Um, obviously, a card like uh, Mad Scientist is powerful in this in the same fashion. Oftentimes, you know, one of the problems you have with a control deck is you really want to be, be able to uh, have an early meaningful board presence that can contest your opponent's early minions. Um, but when you draw that card late game, it's frequently just useless. If it's just a minion, if it's just a minion with like you know just stats basically. Um, but this is actually a pretty powerful effect. If you draw this guy late and you're playing, say, priest, like priest is, a, is specifically the class that, that I I'm, I'm, I look at often two threes for. Um, because you really want a minion that you can kill, uh, that has the stats that can kill early opposing minions, and you can still heal it. You don't just want to trade off. But if you do draw it late in the game, you can play this, and then you actually just get to use your use like your hero power multiple times per turn potentially. Which is, while not necessarily the best use of your mana in lots of situations, can still be a very powerful effect. Um, obviously, this is much less effective for say Rogue, <laughs> um, who using the hero power twice doesn't really do anything. Um, but if you are playing, you know, a class like Priest, class like Warrior. Um, this is a, a very effective like late game tool, I think, uh, and I can even imagine this being a card that like a shaman totem based deck might be interested in playing because if you have a bunch of things that buff your totems, being able to generate multiple totems in the mid game could actually be pretty powerful. Uh, I do think this is a a powerful card. I uh, it, it depends on what the meta game sort of shapes up like, whether this is the sort of card that can realistically see play. But uh, I am definitely excited to try it out. Master Jouster. I don't like this card because. So much of the power of this card is embedded in the, the, the battle cry and the joust effect that like, if you play this card and you lose the joust, it's so bad. Like a five, six for six, no abilities is just a very weak card. But if you win the, if you win the joust, the card is totally busted. <laughs> it's a five, six taunt divine shield for six. It's so powerful. And like, I do think that there is, there is a, a cool, uh, you know, cool gameplay functionality in okay, do I win the joust? Do I not win the joust? That's like an important, uh, an important uh, characteristic of, of like making the gameplay interesting and, and variable and whatnot. Uh, but so much of the power of this is embedded in the random element of it that it's just frustrating when you when, you know if you if you lose like if you lose the, this is a card that you lose the joust you lose the game in in many situations I feel like. And that is just that just seems like it's going to create super frustrating gameplay. Armored Warhorse, uh, four cost five three. It's a juggernaut. The, the joust mechanic, the reveal a minion in each deck mechanic, um, is one that lends itself to wanting to be played in decks that have a lot of high cost minions. So typically, you're going to want it in control decks. Um, but this is a, a combination of stats and ability that wants to go into a an aggressive deck. So generally, the deck that wants to play this is unlikely to win the Joust, uh, which is probably a good thing get, considering the card because a 5-3 charge for 4 is gross in an aggressive deck. Um, so this is, you know, this is a card that, that I, I, I doubt it will see a lot of play in competitive constructed decks um, because the decks that want, you know, the decks that want the combination of stats and abilities are unlikely to win Jousts. Uh, but when it does show up, it has the potential to be really gross. Coliseum Manager. Two five four three inspire return to your hand. So this is a card that uh, that I, that got a lot of flack when it was immediately revealed. People are saying, "Oh, it's the worst card in the game." Yada yada. And I don't think this card is great by any means. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not trying to say that I think this card is like an all star, but I do think that this is a card that that you need to think about in a certain way in terms of you know, okay, well, what 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 is the point of this combination of ability and uh, and stats? And this is actually a card that against like aggressive decks um, can potentially like kill a guy hit your opponent and then like come back and get replayed you know if you consider like inspire as as like you know kind of being able to get a little bit more value out of this card um, to replay it and use it again like that's actually not terrible 
I, I do think that that in general this inspires a drawback. Um, but I think that in the in the right context, you can actually use it as a uh, as an ability where you're able to attack this into like a three two, use your hero power, you know, bring it back to your hand, replay it, and be able to attack you know things again. Um, I don't think this is a good card. I think this is this is generally going to be a weak card. But a two five for three is like not terrible stats. You know, like it, it's uh, the equivalent of you know the the, the one half of Dirt of the Flame, which isn't a good constructed card. Um, but I can imagine actually being a card that you wanted to play in some decks. The problem is that I actually think that the, the decks that want the high health are like Priest, where you'd actually way rather just be able to heal the creature with high health than return it to your hand. Overall, not a particularly great card. It, it could be good against aggressive decks, because it's just able to kill like multiple small minions and then potentially come back for more after that. Alright, moving on. Argent Watchman. This is a kind of cool card. It's a 2-4, can't attack, inspire, can attack as normal. So, this is... A card that I don't know. It's 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 tough for me to imagine uh, places that I particularly want a card like this. It's cool. There's like an overstated overstated creature with uh, the ability to sort of enable it with your hero power. The problem is that like as a two four for two four for 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 two. Generally, what you want it for is you know okay. Well, this can this can help me fight off early minions. This can help me you know kill my opponent's early minions and get sort of an advantage that way. But if you have to like use two mana on turn three in order to allow this to attack an early opposing minion, it's it doesn't seem like it's going to be particularly efficient use of your resources. Okay, so like this could maybe be a reasonable uh, a reasonable way for like a handlock deck to you know have like something you can play on turn two and then like you know you get value out of out of life tapping on turn three, then kill your opponent's guy, then life tapping kill your opponent's guy. That's not likely to happen, but it's sort of a situation I can imagine wanting a card like this, but. Generally speaking, doubt this card's going to be effective, and uh, don't really expect it to show up at least very much in Constructed. Injured Kvaldar. This is a card that I can actually see um, being like a one drop that a uh, like a priest deck might actually want because it can be you know you can play it to contest your opponent's early guys. If they don't attack into it immediately, you can heal your guy and attack their guy. Probably in many cases just worse than Zombie Chow um, because Zombie Chow in those in, in those decks can you know actually just kill your opponent's guy, then you heal it and kill another guy without having to actually use your mana on turn two. Um, it doesn't have the zombie, it does not have the zombie chow drawback though, which is obviously like a, a pretty relevant th uh, deal, and it can, be, it can get to be 2-4, which is actually kind of relevant, like being able to get to 2-4 means that it can potentially kill a 3-2, um, and that's kind of a big deal. If this does see play, I do expect it to be specifically in priest decks. Um, maybe you could see this being played in like a, like warrior decks that care about damaged minions, or damaging your own minions, but probably not. All right, North Sea Kraken. So this is basically just an arena only card, um, or even just a not even arena only card. Uh, and, and I think that it's important for cards like this to exist because right now in Hearthstone, there's basically just a bunch of legendary big high cost minions. And it's like, okay, well, what does a common nine cost minion look like? Uh, and I think that it's that, that it sort of sets you know, the, the sort of context and precedent for what, you know, people can expect. And it's important that you can you can have cards sort of across across casting costs at each rarity um, in order to sort of, you know, contextualize, like, okay, well, how, how cool can this thing be if, if like, you, don't, you only have things that are, you know, of this, of this rarity, of this power level. Um, but this is not a card that's going to see meaningful play. Obviously, everything of, of the comparable cost in Constructed is just much more powerful. Um, but I do think that, that like this kind of card existing from a design perspective is meaningful. All right, Muckless Champion. All right, five cost, uh, four, three with Inspire, give your other minions plus one, plus one. Uh, of, of note, it's a beast, uh, which is potentially relevant. It's another, you know, another generic beast. Um, but uh, this is, you know, kind of a mediocre card. Four cost for a five, three is very, very, very low impact uh, as far as its immediate immediate uh, board presence. And Inspire giving your other minions plus one plus one is a powerful effect, but this is a card that's very rarely going to live through a turn um, because it does have such low stats for its cost. So you're mostly going to play this like on turn seven, and then it's basically a Stormwind Champion with a worse body. Um, so this is kind of a weak card, I think. Um, I do like, you know, that... that they're exploring uh, various ways that you can use Inspire, um, but I don't really expect this card to see a particularly significant amount of play. All right, Clockwork Knight. 
Uh, so five cost five five battle cry give a friendly mech plus one plus one. Many of my early uh, mech mage decks would just have like Azure Drakes or Lotheb or uh, Sludge Belcher or those sort of things because you know I didn't want to have my five drop down at BGH and I you know wanted something sort of on curve at five. And this is something that which is you know the fact that you can you can reduce it with mech warper the fact that it can have. Uh, the ability to pump your guys to, you know, be marginally bigger than your opponent's guys, it's, you know, pretty reasonable thing. Um, I don't I don't know that this is going to be a card that has a significant impact on the way that those decks are built, uh, but it is it is definitely good to see that the new set is supporting old sort of tribal mechanics, uh, and that we are going to see potential cards that may mix things up for how old, uh, old tribal decks are built. Maiden of the Lake. So this is a... A 4 cost 2-6, your hero power costs 1. And uh, this is definitely an interesting card. Um, Stat-wise, you know, 4 cost 2-6. It's, it's, it has a lot of survivability, though obviously not particularly good at killing opposing things. 2, two power for a 4-drop is, is quite weak. Um, but uh, actually being able to use your hero power for 1, the cost jump between 1 and 2 is huge. Um, and the ability to incrementally fit in hero powers when you're playing, you know, things that are that are, you know, slightly off curve, uh, is actually a pretty big deal. Uh, you know, being able to, to, you know, if you're playing he priest, for instance, like the difference between being able to play like, uh, like sludge belter heal my guy on six and like just sludge belter on six is like that can literally change the course of a game. If a deck wants this, I do feel like it's it's potentially a, a deck like priest um, because. Decks that, that get board presence out of their hero power can leverage reduced cost on that hero power more in terms of being able to generate a meaningful advantage from it. You know, whether it's actually going to see play, I don't know, but uh, we'll see. Tournament Medic. Four cost, one eight, which is a weird combination of stats, but okay. Inspire, sort, restore two health to your hero. So this is like kind of a cool card, potentially for like control decks that aren't priest or warrior to give them more ability to sort of have a long game uh, impact and survivability. Um, but I mean, a one eight is just, I don't know, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult for opponents to kill, but it's not gonna have a significant impact uh, on the board otherwise. Seems difficult for this to be a card that you'd wanna play over something like anti Killbot. Uh, because you know you need to activate your hero power four times to get as much health as you'd get from uh, playing anti killbot and using its battle cry, and the body that you're getting out of this is less relevant than anti killbot. So I imagine that you're you know this is a card that's probably not going to really see play. All right, Silent Knight, a two two stealth divine shield. I don't think this is likely to be a card that sees a ton of play. Um, I mean, obviously Scarlet Crusader already isn't. Uh, and the fact that this does less damage than Scarlet Crusader means that it, it also is, you know, less impactful in terms of uh, being able to actually take out, like, other minions on curve and such. So this is just, like, not going to likely be a significant player, but maybe you want to have, like, you know, play this and then, like, you know, buff it with something like Blessing of Kings, and then you have, you know, 6-6 six, six Divine Shield. Obviously, it's super vulnerable to, uh, to silences and such at that point, um, which makes any plan of buff anything often kind of weak uh, but you know it's 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 worth take worth considering uh because having a, a divine shield minion that's pretty much guaranteed to get value out as divine shield is interesting um but three costs for a two two generally not gonna be very exciting all right silver hand regent this is kind of an interesting card because you know three cost that three cost three three is a totally reasonable combination of uh of stats and cost you know we see Lots of three cost three threes see play already, and this is a three cost three three that that gives you sort of additional value every time that you uh, you activate your hero power. The ability of a card like this to be effective is highly reliant on uh, how how viable just one ones are in the meta game. Currently, uh, silverhand recruits are pretty weak uh, in the in the the, the constructed meta game because. They're extremely vulnerable to to patron warrior and all the whirlwind effects and you know being preyed on by grim patrons and things like that. Um, but if that changes, then I do think that this is a card that has a lot of potential. All right, Argent Horse Rider. So this is actually a really interesting card. It's a three cost two one divine shield charge. So this is like Wolf Rider and Scarlet Crusader teamed up. <laughs> um, so. If you're playing a deck that that has like buffs and stuff, like if you if you have you know um, blessing of kings, or if you have 
uh, Blessing of Might, and you're able to potentially get multiple uses out of uh, out of the, the the buff that you know because you are able to to get the Divine Shield uh, effect on it. That's potentially pretty powerful. Um, but uh, if you're looking just to get like max like leverage maximum damage out of your cards. Uh, I think that, that like a deck like like Face Hunter, for instance, is going to generally want Wolf Rider over this because they care more about the incremental damage that they're getting immediately than they do about uh, the possibility of getting additional value out of the individual card. Whereas a deck like um, say uh, Agro Paladin might be more interested in Argent Horse Rider because it is uh, able to potentially get multiple hits in, and the the Paladin deck also, as I, as I mentioned before, has possible ways to buff the card, which. You could potentially get more value out of the buff if it's more survivable because of Divine Shield. But yeah, I, I think that Argent Horse Rider is a card that uh, is potentially likely to uh, change the way that we actually build aggressive Paladin decks, um, and may help uh, may help actually bring back, like, say, aggressive Rogue decks with like Cold Blood. You know, if on turn four you play Argent Horse Rider into Cold Blood. That's actually a lot of damage that that it is difficult to remove because of the divine shield. So, you know, it's 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 interesting because it offers another another possible tool for aggressive decks that might be looking to leverage the survivability of their uh, their minions as well as just want to get damage to the face right away. Flame Juggler. So this is an interesting card. I've seen a lot of people mention that they think that this card is bad, uh, and compared to like Knife Juggler, but this is a totally different card than Knife Juggler. Knife Juggler is a card that you want in uh, a uh, aggressive deck that is going to be, you know, playing out minions afterwards and leveraging those to deal additional damage to your opponent's face and possibly actually kill your opponent's creatures. Flame Juggler, on the other hand, is a card that's actually great against aggressive decks. This is a card that, uh, if you play it on turn two against uh, like a deck uh, like, say, Face Hunter, where you know they are likely to have one damage minions in play can just basically be 2 cost, 2-3, two, battle cry, kill a creature you have. And that's really powerful. That's like a huge tempo swing that can very easily win a game on its own. Um, obviously, if your opponent has just one minion in play, uh, you only have a 50% 50, 50 shot to kill it when you play the, the Flame Juggler. But if your opponent has two minions in play, you're a big favorite to actually just kill a minion with the card. It's just very, very powerful. Uh, and then you have a 2-3 body that can actually kill another minion. So you know, I think that this is, a, this is a card that is very likely to see play uh, if aggressive decks with a lot of one health minions are very popular. So I, I've been seeing people think that they, say that they think this card is bad. I actually think that those people are very wrong. I think Flame Juggler is a card uh, that is likely to actually see a lot of play if the metagame is extremely aggressive. Lance Bearer. Its ability to give another creature a permanent buff is like potentially pretty relevant. Um, the problem, I think, is that if you want this, you know, the, the, uh, the, the buff, like a power buff to a, a small minion, it's generally better to have that be just sort of something you're getting more efficiently with something like Abusive Sergeant, because small minions don't typically live very long. Um, you know, a permanent buff, you're generally, gonna, from, from Lance Bearer, is much more valuable on, say, a, uh, a minion with higher survivability. I could see this being strong with Argent Horse Rider that we were just looking at, something with Divine Shield, um, because generally, you know, if you play your one drop, say you play a Lepernome, and then you Lance Bear your Lepernome, it's like, okay, well, you know, now my Lepernome gets killed and I did two extra damage, but I, but now I just have this one two body instead of, say, you know, a two one that I'd play for cheaper, like Abusive Sergeant. Granted, you want, might want more of that effect in a deck like Zoo or a deck like uh, some sort of aggressive Paladin deck. You might want more of those, those temporary or even permanent buffs. Uh, so maybe Lance Bearer comes it comes in handy there, but it's not as efficient as say Blessing of uh, Blessing of Might. It's not as efficient as uh, Abuse of Sergeant, and the the body that leaves behind is just a one two. Uh, it is potentially very powerful in a deck like Hobgoblin um, because it is it is actually a one power minion that can buff your other minions, and in a, in a deck like a Hobgoblin deck, uh, you do have a lot of minions that are going to be pretty low impact if they don't get buffed. So it can be kind of a card that works well with Hobgoblin and helps your deck work when you don't have Hobgoblin. I could see possible uses for it there, uh, but I don't really expect it to be a common card in just like zoo style decks because uh, I don't think that the the actual impact of the card is high enough, but it's possible that getting the, the sort of aggressive boost right away um, is worth having sort of the, the mediocre leftover body. Lowly Squire. Well, this guy is aptly named. He is lowly, and he's not good. 
<laughs> Last but not least, we have Gadget Zan Jouster. And this is actually a, a kind of interesting card. It's kind of like a, a Zombie Chow style card because it is a cheap minion that you want to play in a deck with big minions. This is not going to be necessarily a particularly consistent card um, because, you know, if you are playing it, uh, if you're not playing it with just like a ton of expensive stuff, uh, it can be, you know, difficult to guarantee that you're getting the buff. Um, and you, you you obviously can't guarantee that you're getting, you're getting the buff because you could always reveal your other Jouster. So, if you, because if you lose a Joust in this to 1 2, which as we just discussed with Lowly Squire is just not that good. It's frequently going to be going to just trade with 1 drops and even just lose fights and get eaten immediately by 2 drops. So, uh, my inclination is that this really won't see much play simply because Zombie Chow is just better. Uh, but yeah, probably, uh, probably not going to see play. Maybe Corner Case uh, in, in, in a, you know, late game deck that, uh, wants extra zombie chows, but uh, I find it unlikely.